In today's match, we are bringing you a Critical Ops Close Quarters game. Number 7 was generated, which translates to Hangar in the rules on the Warhammer community page. The mission is Capture, so a middle-of-the-road APL use mission. The teams you will see include the Chaos Cult. They come with a fixed, standard assortment of devotees and dark commune units. Not much to change out. The devotees will have two units equipped with guises, one with a vile blessing and one with both frag grenade and a trophy weapon, enhancing its pistol. They will be fending off the hive fleet. The squad consists of a warrior leader with bone swords and a despiter, a warrior heavy gunner with swords and a barbed strangler, deadly in the narrow halls of close quarters, a warrior fighter with bone swords and a despiter. All three of these are equipped with feeder tendrils for heals after combat when a unit was crit. They will be bringing a squad of Termagants with Spine Fists into battle. Two of them will be equipped with Flesh Hooks for devastating close-range damage. This will be a test of hordes. The squishy collection of Chaos Heretics and a blend of battle-hardened bugs alongside expendable fodder. The Nids are hoping their adjustment to close-range shooting might help prevent mutations on the side of the Cultists, who are able to mutate their devotees that survive combat and hit for some damage. We'll have to see how this all plays out, as Close Quarters usually allows the cults to take the time they need to ramp their power up, unencumbered. Before we get into it, if you enjoy tabletop games like Kill Team and you are new to the channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, maybe the like if you are so inclined. As well, we have a Discord community linked below. Regale us with your own stories of conquest, show off your prized units, babble on about how odd some of the Games Workshop's rules are written or just hang out, we'll be happy to have you. With all that said, let's get into the grim dark combat of Close Quarters Kill Team. First roll of the game is a three to one, giving the Chaos Cults the choice of attacker or defender. Choosing attacker, the High Fleet picks their side of the board. Fairly easy in these Close Quarters games, as the maps tend to be mirrored for the Critical Ops rules. Both teams place barricades, some being used to deter easy enemy movement, and some to help their units potentially survive an onslaught. Teams split into three groups. Placement begins. The Hive Fleet opens with a handful of Gaunts near point one and two. Spine Fist at the ready and in conceal. A slurry of devotees arrives near points four and five. Covert Guises, Vile Blessing, Frag Grenade and Trophy Pistol on the field. Many in conceal, but one of the Guises near four has engage. The rest of the Gaunts take the field across the edge, giving the High Fleet good access to all their close points, all in conceal. More devotees fill the darkened rooms, engage orders all around. The warriors finally join their minions. Barb Strangler in the middle, flanked by devourers, all in conceal. The warrior leader is placed in position near point one. The Dark Commune arrives, with the Blessed Blades in support of the devotees near points four and five, and the rest arriving near point six. Mind Witch, Demagogue, and Blades in Conceal, Iconarch in Engage. The Hive Fleet is looking to keep its options open when using their stock ploy, and the Cultists are looking to take advantage of the limited firing lines by keeping early aggressive options open with Engage Orders. That Barbed Strangler is certainly something to be afraid of in these tight halls, so we'll have to see how well the close range Cultists adapt in such a situation. Turn 1 begins. Scouting options picked, Infiltration for the Hive and Recon for the Cultists, giving the Nids the first activation. Cult guises trigger alongside the Scouting Dash to move several Chaos units forward. Both teams generate a command point in the strategy phase, and the Hive Fleet leads with their stock stratagem, moving a Gaunt up to the door near point one. The Cult use their free ability to mutate a number of operatives based on the turning point to convert one of the Dash devotees near point four into a mutant selecting Fleet as the Mutant Enhancement for plus one movement to all mutants going forward. Both teams pass and it is on to the Tac Ops reveals. Executioner is revealed and placed on the Warrior near point one. An engaged devotee across the board is picked as a target. This will prevent that devotee from acting freely unless the cults are okay letting points go easily. The cults respond with seized defenses. Forward barricades can be beneficial in close quarters, but against infiltration teams, there is always a risk that your forward barricade can be used to farm an easy two points. First activation of the game, and the forward gaunt opens the door near point one and repositions across the room. A second gaunt activates under the GA2 
and moves to point 1 and captures. A devotee moves to the edge of point 4 and captures, and the marked for death devotee moves behind the wall nearby. The camera blurs as a gaunt opens the door from zone 1 to hallway 2 and moves across the room. Bear with us, this will be fixed in a minute. A second gaunt moves to point 2 and captures. The chaos mutant activates and, with its newfound speed, runs across the room and positions behind the wall, just below all the gaunts. The pair of flesh hook gaunts activate on the far side of the board. One moves to point 3 and captures, and the other takes up a defensive position behind the wall. A pair of cultist devotees move to capture point 5 and 6 from their forward dash locations and try and find aggressive positions along the wall. Another set of gaunts activate, opening the other back door to fully allow movement in their deployment zone, both ending their turns closer to point 3. The cult demagogue activates and repositions onto point 6, then it uses a cursed benediction to convert a nearby devotee into a mutant. The barb strangler warrior advances, certain it won't find a good shot anytime soon. A devotee activates in room 6, and abhorrent mutation is used, giving it the winged enhancement for better movement potential. With a move and a dash, it arrives at the door, and a devotee in hallway 5 moves up as well. The warrior near point 3 rotates to a better shooting angle and passes. A devotee in room 6 moves to open the door, and the devotee with a frag and trophy weapon repositions near point 1. For the Nid's last activation, the warrior leader near point 1 swaps its order using the infiltration scouting option. It then readjusts and gives us the first combat dice roll of the game, firing on the devotee and not losing any attacks due to the allied gaunt being in conceal. 3 plus to hit with rerolls for any ones, 2 crits and 2 hits retained. The devotee has 3 dice on 5 plus to make any saves, only rolling 1 crit and choosing to not command reroll, 10 damage passes through and the warrior leader gets the first blood of the game in turn 1. Not the target that provides points, but a worthwhile target either way. With that, the Hive Fleet has no more actions to be taken. The Cult finishes out turn 1 by moving a devotee behind one of the Hive Fleet's barricades. The Mind Witch activates and places its Malefic Vortex token between a Warrior and a Gaunt, doing one mortal wound to both immediately and one again at the end of turning point 1. It then moves towards point 6 in an attempt to stay safe. The Iconarch opens the door to the middle hallway and moves on to point 6, preparing its Hellfire to greet the oncoming Gaunts. Lastly, the Blessed Blade duo, Joint Activates, opens the door to the middle hallway and takes position near point 5, and with that, turning point 1 ends. Three points for each side, and one for the Cultists on Tac Ops due to the controlled forward barricade. First blood for the Nids, but no Tac Ops points. The reveal of Executioner was mostly used as a way to control which units need to hide away and not approach early on. Not a bad play and one of the many uses Tac Ops can have outside of simply upping their scores. The thing is, the Cults avoided the Barb Strangler for a turn and are ramping up their frontline mutant power. This could give them an edge when finally approaching the always active and critical turn 2 and 3. Let's get back in there and watch as monsters clash with fist, blade, and claw. A 5 to 3 roll for initiative in the cult's favor. Command points are generated and the cultists start things off with the mutation ability for free. Two mutants on the front line get their upgrades to torment status, and chitinous is set for all torments going forward on top of the fleet they already had. The hive fleet uses stock to rotate a flesh hook gaunt back towards the barb strangler, pulling it out of charge distance for the ball of devotees near point 6. The cult uses Fervent Onslaught to retain one normal hit in melee for all cult members. The Hive Fleet responds with Feed, upping the damage of the first crit in melee, all the units hit with by one. Both players pass. For Tac Ops, the Hive Fleet reveals Eliminate Guards, and marks a devotee on point four as both the target for that, as well as the Executioner. First activation of the game, a devotee activates and moves to point 3, opening fire on a gaunt with its auto pistol. A miraculous 2 crits and 1 hit. The gaunt's 6 plus armor save does nothing to help it, and the 7 wound unit falls to 8 damage. A second devotee activates, and abhorrent mutation is used for a command point, providing the winged devotee the sinewed benefit. It rotates back to keep it from being shot at with the barbed strangler. The Nids activate a Gaunt on point 2 and move it into position to return fire on the Devotee on point 3. 
angled just right for no cover save retention. Spine Fists are hitting on threes. Three attacks retained. The Devotee puts up one save, reducing the damage to four, dropping its health to three. The second Gaunt activates and runs up on point three to fire on the same cultist in hopes to finish him. Close enough for no cover saves and far enough from the other to avoid any future torrent damage. Two hits put up by the Spine Fists and the Devotee miraculously saves both. One command point spent on aggressive bio strain to reroll the entire attack. Two hits and the Devotee rolls one crit save, down to one wound. The Cult Demagogue activates, moves into position and uses a Cursed Benediction from Conceal on the one wound cultist, converting it to a mutant and restoring its full wound count. A Gaunt in room one activates and charges the Devotee on point four. A fight ensues. Forgetting my ability to retain a hit, both units only put up two hits. This is super beneficial for the Devotee as it won't die and can still push one instance of damage through, allowing it to mutate and restore all its lost wounds. A second Gaunt activates and moves up to the fresh mutant on point three to unload its flesh hooks. 3 inch range, 2 plus to hit, lethal 5 on 4 attacks, 2 crits and 2 hits retained, a brutal roll for the 3-4 damage line. The mutant puts up a miraculous 2 crit saves, only allowing 6 damage through. Forgetting his feel no pain rolls, he is back to 1 wound. The cultists pile their torment into room 1, activating unleash the demon for a command point. The torment free fights one of the gaunts. Continuing to forget about retaining a hit, the Torment puts up two crits after all is said and done for Relentless and Rending against the Gaunt's one crit. With an opening parry, five damage is dealt to the seven health Gaunt. When reviewing the play, a three was rolled for the hits as well, and we remembered that it would have been retained for the plus one support. So we determined that the Torment would have taken two damage from this sequence. Attacking the neighboring Gaunt after Relentless, all five attacks are retained as normal. The Gaunt's one normal attack is parried and damage is pushed for the kill. The Nid Warrior near point three activates and moves forward, firing on the in-engaged Torment visible behind the wall. Three hits rolled, the Torment retains a save and rolls one more, limiting the damage to three, dropping it to 10. A Devotee on point five activates and opens the door, charging a nearby Gaunt. The second Devotee on the point activates as well and charges, fighting the Gaunt with his supported weapon skill the benefit of GA2 melee. A crit and a hit rolled against one hit from the Gaunt. A normal to normal parry and three crit damage pushed. Damage done, the devotee is rewarded with mutation. The warrior leader activates and charges the torment on point one. Monster on monster action. Three crits and a hit from the bone swords met by a brutal four crits and a hit after rerolls and rending from the torment. It matters not, as 11 damage is all the warrior needs and with the benefit of the damage stratagem, the warrior gets that in two crits. The torment only pushes one crit through for five, leaving the warrior leader at 14 health. A command point is spent on frenzied demise, doing D6 mortals to the warrior. A three is rolled, but feeder tendrils recover two health from the crit strike. All in all, the warrior claims a torment and walks away with 13 health. As well, Robin Ransack is revealed, and the leader scores a point. It now needs to survive until the end of the game for the second point. A devotee near point four activates and charges the Gaunt. Claws and blades collide. Two hits for the Gaunts, three hits for the devotee. Parries back and forth for the opener and two damage pushed. Another mutant on the field. Now, the assumption here is that since the unit was a devotee when it activated, it is still eligible for triggering the GA2 function even after mutation. I may be wrong on this, but I've been waiting for a QA to pop up on the topic. Until then, a second devotee activates near point four with its frag grenade. It has to move and dash to the wall so it can't attack. This is in hope that it will survive and be able to use the grenade in a later turn. Bit of a misplay since the gaunt nearby activates, moves into position and fires on that devotee. Four hits and no saves to speak of, a devotee dies. A second Gaunt activates and moves to fire on the one health mutant. Minus one attack for firing over its engage ordered allies and a possible retain save ahead of it. A crit and a hit rolled. A retain is used, sadly no crit save rolled. The mutant returns to the pool of possible mutations. The Mind Witch activates and moves into position to adjust its malefic vortex, spreading some mortal wound love around the space bugs. The Barb Strangler Warrior activates and having no valid targets, holds its position. The Blessed Blades joint activate 
and reposition on point five, preparing for turning point three. As the nids are out of orders, an overwatch is called on the misplaced cultist mind witch. Five attacks on five plus to hit due to overwatch with rerolls on ones. Not a single five up and not a single one rolled. The torment near point six charges a gaunt on point three, not getting within range of the other gaunt due to the barricade's position. Two hits from the gaunt versus three hits and two crits from the torment. The torment takes two damage and wipes the gaunt out. The spine gaunt calls an overwatch on the torment. Four attacks at three up with the flesh hooks. Two hits, which are both saved by the chitinous monster. The Iconarch activates and moves into position to unleash hell on the warrior and his nearby gaunt. Starting with the warrior, four hits against one save for six damage, lowering it to nine health at this point, thanks to all the mortals from the Mind Witch so far, and another hit of damage coming at the end. The gaunt takes six hits, needing to roll a triple six to survive, the gaunt falls. For the last activation, the Concealed Mutant on point four activates, stays in conceal and fights the gaunt in close quarters with it. The gaunt retains a hit and with the power of support, the mutant gets three hits after Relentless, blocking one and pushing six damage, killing the slightly hurt gaunt. The mutant then rotates to the wall, moving out of sight of the warrior leader for the next turn. Thus ends a brutal turn two. No capture point turnover, so both teams score three points on mains. For the Nids, one point scored on Robin Ransack, and for the Cultists, the position of the Iconarch and the Torment gives the second point on C's defenses. Much of the Gaunt fodder is dead and two of the Warriors are starting to hurt, but Synapse will keep them going strong until their ends, so not much to fear there. But the Cultists still have many cards to play and a round of three mutations going into turn three. Not only that, but it was during this next turn that the cultists remembered that mutants and torments all have five plus feel no pain. This is why I feel that the chaos cults will be seeing a major upcoming nerf. But until then, we press on into turn three. The big turn three initiative, and it ends up as a tie. This gives the Hive Fleet first activation, as ties and kill team are resolved by who went first in the prior turn going second this time around. The Hive Fleet has to get its foothold down now in order to stem the tide of the Chaos Cult. Both players generate a command point. The Nids pass to conserve the points for later. Mutation is called, upping a mutant to a torment near point four and another on point two. The last mutation is used to heal the torment on point three. D3 plus one yields two health, bringing it up from eight to 10. Nids continue to pass. The cults use fervent onslaught again, and then remember that they didn't use it at all in the prior turn. Both players pass. The Nids mark a mutant on point four for executioner as well as eliminate guards, as not much else is really all that viable for those marks. A gaunt on point three activates and fires flesh hooks into the Iconarch three crits and a hit with no saves thrown. Even though his aura reduces the damage of the crit to three, the Iconarch still takes 12 damage and falls. With its last action point, the Gaunt charges the Torment. The Gaunt near point four activates on GA2 and tries to soften up the mutant target nearby. Four hits with only one crit as a response. Six damage on the mutant, leaving it at one health. The Gaunt then charges the mutant to keep it from fleeing. The Cultist Demagogue activates and uses Induced Slaughter on the neighboring Torment, making it fight the Gaunt. Fervent Onslaught retained, four hits in total after rerolls. The Gaunt gets two, both sides pushing damage, causing the Torment to take two as the Gaunt falls. The Demagogue then uses Incite Urgency to make the Torment dash between her and the Warrior. A bit of a bad position with the upcoming Blast, but it happens. Noticing this, the Barb Strangler Warrior activates and fires on the Torment, getting the Demagogue in the blast, minus one attack for firing over the combat between them. Four attacks on a four plus against the Torment. No hits are rolled. A command point is spent on aggressive bio strain and another four dice are rolled. All misses again. The worst possible outcome. The Demagogue takes two hits and makes one save, suffering four wounds. The luckiest Torment on the map activates and charges the nearby warrior, initiating a fight. Two crits and a hit against the warrior's crit and three hits. A crit is pushed from the Torment. A crit is pushed in response from the warrior and another crit kills the warrior. Two wounds left on the Torment. 
the warrior leader activates and uses Will of the Hive Mind to get 3 APL. It charges the torment on point 4 as the mutant is just out of range due to the aggressive barricade. The point is captured and a fight ensues. A crit and two hits from the warrior and two crits and two hits from the torment. When all is said and done, in order to survive, the warrior has to go on the defensive, parrying a crit and a hit, allowing a crit and a hit through, and pushing a hit in response. Four damage to the torment, nine to the warrior. Vile blessing is used to ignore the four. The blessed blades activate simultaneously and split up. One charges the gaunt on point two, the other on point four. Starting with the gaunt on two, three hits are retained, one for the gaunt. After a parry, the gaunt takes eight damage and is felled. The second gaunt puts up no hits against two hits and a crit, another gaunt felled. As there are no more nids to activate, the turn is played out. The torment on two charges the barb strangler warrior and fights. Four hits from the torment versus three hits and a crit. The Torment chooses to go on the defensive. By the end of the fight, two parries from the Torment and one from the Warrior have the Warrior taking four damage and the Torment whittling down the six to a five with the feel no pains that the cultists just now start remembering. A heal of one helps the Warrior out a little in response. The Torment on four goes to see how that combat ends. Two hits from the Warrior versus three hits from the Torment. Four damage needed, so the Warrior leader dies. With the board fairly barren, scoring is called. For the end of turn 3, a devotee the cultists maintain near point 3 would rotate and use the TAC op install device on the point. The torment that had just killed the Nid leader would start working towards the enemy drop zone. The mutant on point 4 would return control to the cult. At this point, the scores would still be very close. For turn 4, some ideas play out. Best case scenario. Point 3 is taken by the cult. After heals, the torment could survive combat. Point 4 could be taken by the Blessed Blade, but Point 1 would remain on Nid control due to the Torments being unable to perform mission actions. But with most of the Nid Tac Ops locked out, and with Faction Tac Op 1 for the Cultists revealed as both Torments move and dash into the enemy deployment zone, scores are settled. Eighteen to eleven in the cult's favor. The biggest part of the swing was the tac ops that became scorable. Install device only got one point as it has to last for a whole turn. With both torments in the end zone, tear through is revealed at the end of the game and both points are scored. Even though five points are held by the cult in turn four, only four points can be scored. It would only limit the points the nids would have gained. Still, the overall match was decided by a small handful of rolls that went wrong. In particular, when Fate decided the Barb Strangler would not hit the Torment in two full volleys of attacks. Games of Kill Team can be decided in such moments, and it can be disheartening when it happens, but we collect ourselves in the aftermath and continue in our efforts to appease the gods of RNG. With all this done, what do you think of the match? We talked about how using Gene Stealers or Hormigons with flesh hooks in bulk could have changed a lot of this outcome. Although, had the cultists remembered the feel no pain rolls, who knows what could have happened. And what do you think of the cults? Definitely a team that will see nerfs soon. Some people lower the total devotees by two. Some people adjust how the wounds work when they transform. Things like healing when they transform. D3 for the mutants, D6 plus one for the torments, of course only to their maximum potential health. What do you think Games Workshop will do to try and rein them in a little? Thanks for watching. We at the Kimmerix Project will continue to try and bring you all more battle reports as we go forward. As a reminder, we have a community discord you can join to regale us with your own battle reports if you'd like, maybe show off some of your projects or even banter about the gray areas in Games Workshop's rules. And as always, likes for the like god and subscribes for the subscribe throne. I am Kimmerix, and I'll see you in the next one.